you as it has spoken to me. Let me just put this here. Change you as it has changed me, challenged you, encouraged you, blessed you. It is so rich. It is a psalm that is it's powerful. It's profound in its teaching and its lessons and what it has to share with us, but it's also so personal, this personal writing of David that we have access to that we can read and hear and he's so blatantly honest in it. It's raw. It's real. He's talking about real things. And I think that there's so much in this psalm that I really believe that no matter what need you walked in here with tonight, that Psalm 27 is going to meet you right there. God will use the Psalm of David not only to meet your needs, but to encourage you in your faith and to draw you closer and closer to him. The theme verse that you can see on the um, front of your very pretty handout here is uh, verse 11. It says, teach me your ways, O Lord, and lead me in a smooth path. And I am confident, actually excited that the Lord has brought us all here this weekend to use this psalm to teach us and to lead us. Don and I will attempt to cover all the verses together. She's going to share with you tomorrow morning. But I hope you will dive in and dig in yourself. I, she mentioned this, and I'll mention it again. Please read it before you go to sleep. Read it first thing tomorrow when you wake up and begin to claim it for yourself. Because in it, David addresses many of life's problems, life's fears, life's hurts. And today, I think that we are living in a time of darkness. I think people are more fearful than I've seen them before. Longing for safety. Our cities aren't safe. Um, our schools are no longer safe. People are weak, in need of the strength. All of these things that we are need, the light, the strength, the confidence that we can live lives where we're not fearful and we tend to worry less. All of these are addressed in this psalm. I read this cute story about during the U.S. Civil War, um, fierce fighting was taking place near this little town in West Virginia, kind of in your area here, because the town was close to enemy lines, and it would be controlled one day by the Union troops and then the next by Confederates. So each army kept coming in and taking over this little town. And in the heart of this town lived an old woman. It wasn't me. And according to the <laughs> testimony of her minister, one morning, several enemy soldiers knocked on her door and demanded breakfast. So she asked them in and said she would prepare something for them. And when the food was ready, she said this, she said, it is my custom to read the Bible and pray before breakfast. I hope you won't mind. They consented and she took out her Bible. She opened it at random and began to read from Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? And she read on through the last verse where it says, wait of the Lord, be of good courage. He shall strengthen your heart. And when she finished reading, and she said, let's pray, while she was praying, she heard sounds of the enemy army rushing out of her house as fast <laughs> as they could, because they had heard about this God with the strength and the light, and how he could conquer and rule over enemies and protect her. It was written by David. As you know, the time is not certain. Um, it was a time of trouble, but David was always in trouble. Um, he, he lived a very, he lived a blessed and amazing life of how he served God, but he also lived a life of, of tragedy, of people turning against him. His own son wanted to hunt him down and kill him. I can't imagine that kind of grief and that kind of fear. Um, so he writes from his experiences, and um, he's so honest about it. But in the first part, which we will see um, today and some of tomorrow, we see David, he's on the highlands of his faith, and he's trusting on these highlands but in the second half we see him and he's down in the lowlands of fear and he is trembling in fear in fact there's such a contrast to these two sections of the psalm 
that many scholars believe that maybe David didn't write this at all. How could one man have had th these extremes of faith and fear? However, I only have to look at myself and probably for you to look at yourself to realize this is kind of the way it is. I can go from fear to faith and from faith to fear back again while I'm having my morning coffee. <laughs> this is what life is like. But God has the answer to these issues. He has what we can trust and believe in in this song. I'm a list maker. I make a list every morning when I get up. I even put things on it I've already done because I like to cross things off. Um, but I love to make a list of a section of... Does anybody else do that? Yes, yes thank you. Um, all the things that he says. He says um, what he says to God. Hear me, answer me, teach me, lead me, and be merciful. He also says what not to do. Do not hide from me. Do not turn from me. Do not turn your servant away. Do not reject me. And do not forsake me. All in this one psalm, he also says what he will do. I will seek. I love this. I will sing. I will shout. I will be confident. And I will wait. All in these few verses. It looks like David is in the middle of a trial, the middle of maybe even a battle. But he begins in the middle of this trouble with what he knows about God. And when we read it, I sense and feel that even in the middle of this, David has found his God to be all that he needs. I always think it's good to begin with what you know. And David not only begins in this first verse with what he knows, he begins with who he knows. And it is the who he knows that makes all the difference. And in the very first verse, the first two words, the most important of the whole psalm, the Lord. It begins with him. The Lord is going to be everything that he needs him to be in this troublous time. Jehovah, Almighty God, let him be where you start. Start with him. And the next word is just a small little word, two letters, is, my, is the word my. And if you can say the Lord is my, then you are on the right track. That possessive, tiny little pronoun that speaks to him and is reminding him that this, the Lord is my, and all the things that he's going to claim him to be. Begin with that. Begin with him. He's all you need, and he has everything that you need. And then he goes on to say, the Lord is my light and my salvation. And then I love this question that he asked himself, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? David uses this personal pronoun three times in just one verse. The Lord is my life. The Lord is my salvation. The Lord is the strength of my life. He is claiming what God is to him. And claiming it and speaking it makes him realize that there is nothing and no one that he needs to fear. He is the light in the dark, this dark world because Jesus is the light of the world. And not only is he the light, but we are now. He gives that light to us. Now we are the light. We have it. We're supposed to shine it. Have you, can you ever remember a time where things look so dark, where the world looks so dark? We are seeing, I think we're in the last days. Everything that I know about, every prophecy has been fulfilled that needs to be fulfilled before Jesus comes back. And I am seeing the world just turn to darkness, to evil. They're calling evil good and good evil. And um, another um, prophecy of the end times is that even the very elect will be deceived. Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing long-time Christians that I have known and loved and walked this life with turn to this stupid deconstructing of their faith. I have a friend in Nashville. He's a very well-known musician. If I told you who he was, that I don't want to be gossiping about him, you would probably 
know who he was and I've been in touch with him for the last 30 years and he has walked away totally from his faith. He started being a deconstruct, I'm just deconstructing my faith. Last time he wrote me, he said, well, I have decided and I, I'm a universalist and a pantheist. Oh, no. And I said, I don't want to say his name, and I, I wrote him back and I said, no, you are backslidden. You have just totally walked away from the Lord. You have walked into darkness. You have walked into lies. You have walked into disbelief. And he's taking so many kids who have followed him as a musician for years and years and years. And he wrote back and he said, oh, Sandy, maybe I'm not backslidden. Maybe I'm just growing. Oh. And that's how they feel. We're just grow we're into a whole new experience with God outside of scripture, outside of the truth. But Jesus, in this dark world, he is the light. And he gives us the light, and now he says that you are the light. So we have it. We better get shining it. Because we are his light here now in this dark place where we're living, in this dark time. I love it where it says, you are the light of the world, and then these two little worlds, so shine, it says. And one day I was just reading through that, and I went, so shine. So I was thinking about, okay, my husband was a little bit unkind to me this morning. And um, I probably should call him up and tell him that he hurt my feelings. And then I, I, I went, oh, or I could just oh, so shine. I could do that. Just so shine. And I don't mean the quantity. I mean just so shine. <coughs> Someone hurts your feelings. You want to go after them. Shine the light instead. Take those two little words and make it kind of what you're going to do and how you're going to show all of those around you who your Jesus is. But this word light here is an interesting word because it says, you are my light and my salvation. And the word light that is used in the original language actually means a saving light. So this light of salvation, it is a saving light that has saved him. And you know what? I think it's about time for us as Christians to maybe um, step up and not hang back and be bold um, with our faith and be bold with the light that we have that brought us to salvation. You know, scripture says that people are saved by the blood of the lamb and the word of their what? Testimony. Testimony. Go share with somebody this light that saved you. Go tell your story. People love to hear and that people are always amazed at what God has done. The world is desperate for this good news that we have in the gospel. There is no good news but this good news. I, I don't care who we elect, well, I care, but come November, the only thing that's gonna save this country is, is a move of God. And we know who he is, and we've gotta start telling people about this God of ours. I'm always amazed when I get bold enough to share my faith, how open people are. Uh, Mike and I were at a, and we were, we had a big team, I forget, we were someplace, maybe we were in Mexico doing a crusade. And every morning we all met together and we held hands and we prayed. And there was a girl behind the desk, watched us every, every morning. And maybe about the fifth day we were there, we come, we get together, we're gathering for prayer, we're holding hands, and she walks up and she breaks into the circle and she takes our hands. And I looked at her and I said, are you a Christian? And she said, no, but I want to be. Aww. See how simple that just can be, that witness of God's love, that light shining. Um, so claim the first verse as your own. It belongs to you also. It belonged to David and it belongs to you. You are my light. You are my salvation. And you are my strength. He has given all that to us and we are called to shine, to live in this strength and light and salvation that he has given us, given us. These three things are really what we need in order to live this Christian life, all in this first verse. Now, um, David had personal knowledge of the light, salvation, and strength. He had seen it through his life. He's going to need it in what he's going through. He's going to depend on it. We'll see him as we work through Psalm 27, how he draws upon the light and the strength and the salvation in order to go on. 
But he, what he is saying now is fed and fueled and supported by his experience. These are the things he knows about God. These are the things he has had from God. And you and I have a story. Don't you have a story? I have a story of God being these things to me. In my past, he has strengthened me. He has given me light when I didn't know where to go. In my present, he is doing these same things. In my future, he will be faithful to do it again. You have a story, just like David has a story. Maybe when you do your devotions tomorrow, or, or even this e evening, write down all the times that you can recall and remember. Or, first of all, think about what it was like when you first got saved. Let's just camp right here on that salvation. Because one of the things that God had against the churches in the book of Revelation, they had left their first love. Make sure that you are still in that place in your salvation of that first love relationship with him. Maybe go back and remember how it happened, when it happened, how it changed you, how it made, saved you, how it maybe healed you. Make a list of all the times when you had been weak. You know, I love the qualification for getting the strength. You know what it is. Weakness. Mm -hmm. So I'm well qualified. I'm weak most of the time. Mm -hmm. I, I come into the agenda. I'm weak. And he promises to strengthen us. All of this you know as well as David's know. David knows. David's enemies in the past, his foes. <laughs> That's a cute ringtone. I think I want, I think I want that one. Um, he has seen God save him. He has seen God deliver him. He has seen God take his enemies out. And that has given him confidence. And yet... As we will see as we work through this psalm, his confidence is going to fail, and his faith is going to fail, and fear is going to take over, and yet God is going to pick him up again, and he's going to get back on track. Remember that you have a history. Add to your list of all the things that God has done for you, all the times he's met you, all the times you've been so weak you couldn't even do a thing, and he has strengthened you. You are just as qualified to write these verses and live this life as David was. It's not just for a king. Mm -hmm. It's for all of us. And speak those things into the doubt and the discouragement that comes into your life. Maybe even write your own psalm. Just start with these three truths. Mm -hmm. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Remind yourself all the times he has proven. I, I, you know, looking back, it, it, it kind of felt like God was going to be late or he wasn't going to do anything at all. But when I, I look back at all my doubts and all my fears and anxiety and worries, I don't think he has ever once been even a nanosecond late. Mm -hmm. he had, and I know he's never once failed me. And even in the midst of tragedy and in times of trial and tribulation. And I, is anybody else, I'm seeing more tragedy than I've ever seen. Anybody else? More people that I know personally are suffering from terrible loss. Um, I know more people um, seriously ill than I've ever known before. Maybe it's because I'm really old now. And But I know young people who are ill. I, um, I was at a pastor's wife's something somewhere and I can't remember where and I asked if anybody had a prodigal um, to stand up, 75% of the room stood up. Whoa. Those are kids that have grown up in a Christian mm -hmm. home. Any of you have a prodigal? Yeah, see? He's faithful, even with the prodigals. <clears throat> anyway, maybe write your own psalm. Remind yourself. Think back to that um, light dawning day when Jesus became real for you. And how long has it been since you've really sat and thanked him for that salvation? When was the last time you, you praised him for his strength? It's poured into you, poured upon you in your weakness. We need to be aware of all that he has done for us because when we know and when we believe and when we hold on to it, then we can go on into whatever life brings whether it's tonight or tomorrow, 
One guy wrote, what else do you need in life behind the truth of Psalm 27? <laughs> it's, all, it's, it's a life manual, the whole thing. Christ, in his infinite loveliness, draws us to him, asks us to remember all he has been, asks us to praise him like we did here tonight in worship, Ask us to trust him again, to let go of our fear. Do you know the word fear in the Bible is um, 365, 365 days? Like there's one, it's fear not, I'm sorry. There's like a fear not for every day, and then an extra one for one a day that you need to. Um, and yet, I love that scripture says, when you are afraid, many, many times. God knows that there are going to be times when we are afraid, but we can fear not, and Donna's going to share that with you tomorrow. This light, you've got these three things, the light, the salvation, and the strength, is how I actually began my journey of faith, my relationship um, with God. Um, I, was a, I grew up in the church. <clears throat> I grew up in the Methodist church. Maybe there's some Methodist churches that are good and preached in the word out there, but mine wasn't. I went to, no, you were a Methodist too? Yeah, I went to church every <clears throat> Sunday. I sang in the choir. Um, I did all that I was told to do. I think I was even confirmed. I don't even know what that meant, but I was a confirmed Methodist. I was a member of the church. Um, and yet I had never heard about God's salvation plan, and I don't think I knew one born-again Christian. Not one. The whole time I was growing up. And I um, grew up in Chicago, between my second and third year of college, I just wanted to see what California was like. So I, I came out to California, I uh, got a job at Disneyland. You know, it's a little Illinois girl's dream come true. I'm living in California, I'm working at Disneyland. Um, and um, while all that was happening, this I met this <clears throat> young man. Um, he was playing his harmonica on the street corner um, and people were dropping uh, quarters in his hat um, and I'd never my family was very traditional very conservative um, and, and I was what you might call I was a good girl I did what they said I was obedient I went to the schools they wanted me to go to I got good grades all my friends were good people and then I came to California and then this this young kid um, shows up and he came to my apartment where I was living with some friends I was working at Disneyland with and I'd never seen anybody like him. He didn't have any shoes, he didn't have a place to live, he didn't have a car, he was hitchhiking around the country. Um, but he was the cutest thing I had <laughs> ever seen. I was fascinated by him. And um, three weeks later, we drove to Las Vegas and we got married. Now, I'm not as dumb as I look because <laughs> he actually told me that he was between semesters at med school. He was a high school dropout. He also <laughs> told me that he was in a really well-known uh, rock band that he couldn't even tell me the name because I'd know right away. And he, had, he knew three chords in his guitar that he couldn't even play and make a song out of. He, he, he lied to me. And I bought into the whole thing, even though in the back of my mind I'm thinking, could this guy be real? But anyway, ran away to Las Vegas, um, got married, and then I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to tell my mom and dad in Illinois what I have done. Um, and he had no job. And I'm telling you, he had no shoes, <laughs> no place to live. So I get a job. Of course, I go out and get a job. And I'm at work on this big ship that floats in Newport Bay as a waitress. And, um, and he's floating around the bay in his paddleboard. And one of the waitresses I was working with came up to me and I said, there he is, isn't he cute? And she says, why is he out there and you're in here? And I went, oh yeah, why am I working? And he's floating around on his paddleboard. But still, I thought I could fix him. <laughs> if you're married here today and you're still believing that dream <laughs> let it go <laughs> I could I could not fix him and not only was he not what he said he was he was um, he was troubled 
Um, he was experimenting with psychedelic drugs. Um, and um, this all came to light as we lived together. But after, after maybe about nine months, I got pregnant. We had our first baby and um, things went from bad to worse. He was never home. There were lots of drugs. Um, and then I found out I was pregnant again and I realized that I really could not, I could not stay with him. I didn't feel safe with him. And I called my, my family and they came and got me and took them, me home with them. And I stayed there until <clears throat> I had our second baby, which was a boy. So now I've got a girl and a boy and I'm a single mom. And um, I came home and my, my brother's an attorney, so he did all the divorce for me and I, I divorced him. But because I had two of his children, he did occasionally show up at my door. While I was waiting for the second baby to be born, he got so destroyed on drugs that he ended up in a mental hospital for quite some time. And when I got home, he told me about that. And um, I, I, want, I asked if I could go and talk to his doctor. So I went and had made an appointment with the doctor. Um, and I asked him what the prognosis was on a long range. And he said he probably will be in and out of custodial care the rest of his life. Um, <clears throat> And, and he would come over, but his, he was so brain damaged. He could hardly say a, a sentence with a subject and verb. Mm -hmm. um, but then he started to come over, and all of a sudden, he looked different, and he sounded different. And one day he came and he said, um, what do you know about Jesus? <clears throat> and I said, <clears throat> well, a lot more than you do. <laughs> I went to church my whole life I know hymns I sang in the choirs that was my big claim to fame I knew hymns and he said no I said that wrong not what do you know about Jesus but do you know Jesus and I looked at him and I said you know I've bought everything you were selling I'm not buying this um, the drugs the, the everything go away but he's kept he was a hound of heaven he would not stop and I watched him over a period of weeks go from a brain damaged crazy guy to a guy that made sense. And he told me that one night he'd gone to Little Calvary Chapel to a men's prayer meeting on a Saturday night and, and he was, he was miraculously healed of all the brain damage. But still, come on. Um, then, then he came over and he said, hey, you need a night off. And he was kind of, he was okay by night. He wasn't too crazy. He said, there's a, a band you will love playing down at Corona Del Mar. Go down there, and um, I know you'll like them. I'll stay here with the kids. So I got my car. I drove down. I get to Corona Del Mar. It's that scene in the, in the movie, and I thought, wow, there's a couple thousand people here. This must be a really good band. <laughs> and I get out, and I'm walking closer, and, and closer I get. I don't hear any band, but when I got up close, I looked, and there wasn't a band. There was just a guy with a guitar, and I went, here we go again. He never tells me the truth but then I looked it around at all these people and they were not there to hear the guy play the guitar they were getting they were in line to get baptized and all of a sudden I had this thought I'm gonna get baptized I don't know why I'm gonna get baptized so I get in line I'm standing there and I want you to know I wasn't a hippie I was I was from the Midwest when I finally started going to Calvary Chapel full time, I had to come home from school, take off my preppy clothes, and put on an old granny dress and go on my bare feet so that I would fit in. But anyway, so I so I get in line, and um, and I and I'm standing there, and this big, tall surfer guy next to me said, "Hey, you're going to get baptized?" I said, "I think I am." He said, "Are you saved?" I said, "I have no idea." He said, "It's okay." I've been safe three weeks. I know exactly what to do. <laughs> <laughs> and he put his hand on me and led me in the sinner's prayer. So now it's my time. To, and I walk out, Chuck Smith comes, gets me, takes me out into the water. He says, do you want to get baptized? He said, I said, I do. He said, are you saved? And I said, get yeah, right back there in line. <laughs> and he said, well, that works for me. <laughs> and he baptized. And then I had to go back home to my husband Michael and tell my ex-husband and tell him okay you were right about this one thing this one thing and then I was the happiest Christian you ever saw I love church I love going I love hanging out my kids love Sunday school I was there every service that there was 
Um, and then, then he comes start talking to me, telling me that he thinks that we should get married again. <laughs> I said, you know, I, I'm glad you're a Christian. I'm glad I'm a Christian. We, sh- we share this faith now. You're going to be a, a good dad to our kids. But if you think for a minute that I could ever really forgive you or trust you or feel safe with you or get married to you again, you are sadly mistaken. That is not going to happen. That is not going to happen. So I'm driving to my class at Long Beach State one day, and I'm talking to the Lord about this. And, um, and I'm, I'm actually using these, these words from Psalm 27. Mm-hmm. I'm talking to him about how happy, how thrilled I am that I was saved. And I was telling him, boy, that light, standing in line that night, and that light that came in to, to my being and ch- revealed to me that I was just as much as a ruined sinner as Mike was. You know, I thought, that's good for you. You're a bad boy. I'm the good girl. But that light that God showed me I needed to get saved, that I was also a sinner in need of a Savior. Um, and I was thanking him for that. And then I started talking to him about this thing that my husband wants to, my ex-husband, Mike, wants to get married again. And certainly, God's on my side. Aren't you on my side? Come on. <laughs> and and I'm, I'm, I think we're having this conversation where he's just agreeing with me, but it, there's no, no response coming from him at all. And so I'm going through all the reasons, you know. He, he was horrible. He led me down a terrible paths. Um, he never came home at night. He was drunk all the time. He used drugs. I mean, I, this, whole, this whole thing. I don't know I could, that I could ever, ever, even though I still loved him, I didn't know if I could ever, ever go back to him again. And so I laid my case out. I'm driving to school. It's really quiet. And all of a sudden, and you're going to think I'm weird, but you're going to know I'm weird the longer I'm here. But (laughs) out of what sounded like it came out of the speaker of my car radio Mm -hmm. was this voice that sounded kind of like my dad's voice Mm -hmm. that said just this. Behold, I make all Mm -hmm. things new. Mm -hmm. And I went, well, that was crazy. I got off the freeway, I pulled over, turned off my car, turned off my radio, and sat there again. And the voice came again, just as deep, just as strong. Behold, I make all things new. And I I didn't even know that was a scripture. It was such a new creature. I went home, I'm going through my Bible. Oh, he does say he makes all things new. But I'm going, I don't think he could make this thing new. But because that light had brought me to salvation, now God began to strengthen me through his word and to show me that he could and he would make all things new. And I took that tiny little step of faith with just a little bit that I knew about my God. And he strengthened me as he did it. And I called up Mike and I said, okay, I'm in. But boy, this better be good, because <laughs> I'm still scared of you. And a year later, we walked down the um, aisle of Calvary Costa Mesa. Our little girl, Mindy, was our flower girl. And you know, when I called my parents to tell them that I'd run off with this guy that they'd never seen or met and weren't going to like, um, <laughs> you, you know what my dad, my dad said to me? He said, you know... Ever since I first saw you in your mother's arms, I have dreamed of the day that I would walk you down the aisle and give you to another man. And now that day is gone. But on that day, when God was making all things new, my dad walked me down the aisle and gave me to Mike McIntosh. And his, because we made those choices, we were operating in his light, we were both now saved, I, we felt his strength just pouring through us. And he has proven his words to me to be more true than I ever could imagine. He has made all things new. I thought I loved him before, not the way that I love him now. And if I hadn't trusted with my tiny little bit of faith, a scripture that was spoken to me that I didn't even know was, was a scripture... I would have missed, I would have missed three more children. 
I, that, that makes five. And she said, we have six because Mike had a, because he was a bad boy, as I told you. His girlfriend had a baby when he was 16 years old. We went and found her. She is now part of our family. Um, I would have missed her. I would have missed our three more children. I would have missed watching this guy who was a high school dropout choose to go back to school about 15 years ago and get three undergraduate degrees, two masters, and um, his doctorate. Mm -hmm. He has surprised me every single day. Mm -hmm. I would have missed see him, seeing God take him into the ministry. I would have missed seeing him preach. I would have missed traveling the world with him and watching thousands come to Christ mm -hmm. as he exercised his gift of evangelism. I would have missed being here with you. I would have missed knowing Donna. So God's going to give you a little bit that he's going to ask you to do. And then, just as, as with David, the light of the salvation, and then now when I choose to live in obedience to him, that strength just comes pouring in. Somebody said to me when I was sharing this um, story a little bit ago, somebody said to me, well, you know, that was then. God's not doing things like that now. Mm -hmm. I said, that is so not true. Mm -hmm. God is just as able. Mm -hmm. He is just as anxious. He That's is right. just as willing mm -hmm. to do to any one of you sitting here today miraculous, unbelievable things to strengthen you, to teach you, to guide you, to pull you into his presence, to heal you, to take care of your worries, to take care of your grief. All those things, God is, he's just the same as he was then. In fact, I think he's even more active because he sees what's going on and he's getting ready to come back. So take these. These are, these are your verses as much as they are mine. This is God's encouraging word to you tonight that he is your light and your salvation and your strength. I just had a question. Yes, ma'am. He did. Oh, thank you. Yes, he did. He went back. He made a, uh, an appointment with him. And if you knew my husband, you, you, everybody loves him. He just, so you could tell this, I went with him. You could tell this doctor was, and Mike walked in and he sat down and the guy looked at him and said, what in the world has happened to you? Wow. wow. And so Mike shared about the healing and whatever. And he said, you sit before me today. And I, this is nothing that I have done. This is all something Supernatural, he said. I've never seen anything. Especially, he said. Yeah. 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 No, it was cool. It was cool. And I would have missed both my parents coming to Christ. I would have missed mom, Mike's mom coming to Christ. I would have missed all of that. The life that God has given us. And don't assume that it has been easy. It hasn't. It has been as full of tragedy, maybe even more so than many of you. There's been lots of tears, lots of trials. But God has never, ever backed off from being my light and my strength and my salvation, just as he won't for you. Let's pray. Mm -hmm. Father, you are, you are so incredibly faithful. And you are so beautifully personal. And I know that every girl that sits here tonight came in with some hurt, some worries, some weakness, some fears, as we all did, because I did too. Would you use your word in this beautiful psalm that each one here would feel encouraged, would be enlightened by these verses? Just the first three are life-changing. I could live the rest of my life with these three, that you are my light, my salvation, and my strength. Prove yourself. Show yourself to these women in ways that I can't explain or teach or ramble on about at all. You do a work that only you can do. And I ask these things in the precious name of that one who saved me. Jesus. Amen. Amen.